each one is walking. It's amusing. Now, unfortunately, where it says continue watching on Twitter is hiding what we want to look at. But I can tell you right here is the first sign that we're looking at Maddie. Uh, not Maddie, Kaylee. And then Jack is right next to Kaylee, like right next to her. Maddie's just a little bit further back. No, it's fun to watch. See him? Okay, so here's, here's Kaylee. Here's Jack. One of the reasons this is kind of important right here is it gives you it, it gives you a really good perspective how much bigger he is than her. She's a tiny little thing. But look at how much bigger he is. Easily overwhelm her. Easily overtake her. No no trouble. And look how far she's kind of walking out around in front of him. And then take notice of how close he steps in right behind her back. To me, it looks menacing. It looks like a power move. Almost like he's saying, you may think you're going to walk away from me, but I can stay with you every step you take. Watch other people dance for She's got her, she's got her uh, phone in her hand. He's not getting out of her way. The boat, he had, you know, he'd get drunk and act stupid and he gave it this alter ego a name, right? Well, Jack has an alter ego, people. They, when Jack gets drunk, he gets, you know, aggressive. And his buddies, the people that know him, they named this alternate person, the, the drunk Jack or the angry Jack or the aggressive Jack. They called him Terry. Yeah, the Murdoch murders. Yes, thank you, Allie. So, so Jack has an alternate. His name is Terry. But if, if that doesn't tell you that Jack, on the outside, Jack's handsome, he's attractive, wealthy family, well-connected family, long history, elite lineage, But when he gets messed up, Terry comes to play. Matthew. It's like a horror movie. Why? Why? And they were oh, standing up. You're uh, caught up in the snow. Um, well, no, I guess there wasn't snow at that time, though, was there? It was cold. It was icy. But I don't think they actually had snow on the ground until like a week later. But, but nonetheless, I, you know, there definitely would have been evidence there with, with, you know, the, the overall trauma to the bodies, the, the amount of blood in that house was massive. And we saw evidence of that with it seeping, you know, through the siding and onto the concrete. So I talked about Jeremy Reagan. That was number one because Jeremy Reagan inserted himself into this story. He did. And those of you that are that are standing up, you're saying, no, no, it's wrong. You can't talk about Jeremy Reagan. Don't talk about Joe. Don't talk about this person, that person. Why? These are people specifically that have inserted themselves into the story they did not do one tiny, simple little interview. They began to make the story about themselves. And, and from a psychological perspective, that is quite interesting. Why? Well, let me ask you this question. God forbid your next door neighbor, the people living in the apartment across the hall from you, what what happens if, if they meet some horrible end and it gets broadcast over all of mainstream media and it become, it captures the attention of the nation? Are you, are you going to insert yourself into the story? Are you going to give out interviews over and over and over and over? Are you going to want to see your photo placed on all newspapers, shown up on Fox News? No, you won't. The greatest majority of people would say, hey man, I didn't, I didn't see nothing. I don't know these people. I can't help you. 
and we would keep on walking. If you agree, put a one. If you agree that if someone in your life were to, were to meet a tragedy that captured the attention of the nation and, and you had cameras there, Ashley Banfield show is there, people trying to interview you, are you going to be willing to have your photograph and your name wrapped up in a great murder mystery? Or are you going to just keep on walking and say, no, thank you, not my monkeys, not my circus? If they're not your monkeys, put a one. If you would happily join the, the circus and be a part of all these interviews, put a two. I'm just curious. Don't mess with my toot toot. Don't mess with my toot toot. All right. So you can see that most people would not. Now, if it's somebody that's close to you, if perhaps it was a friend of yours, someone that you spent some time with, you might do an interview. You might do an interview and talk about, you know, what was fun about this person, the things that they achieved, their accomplishments, that sort of thing, right? Kind of kind of kind of your way of memorializing your friend. But let's be clear about Jeremy Reagan. Jeremy Reagan claims to have not known these four people. Think about that. He didn't know them. According to him, he didn't see anything. He, there were no lights that he, that he would have made it possible to see anything. Oh, really, Jeremy? You're paying attention to the lighting now? You didn't see anything. You didn't know them. You, In fact, that means that you don't know anything more than what I know. But now you're paying attention to where the lights are, the lights that used to work, and now they don't work. But, you know, being aware of your surroundings, inserting yourself into a murder mystery, those are things that, you know, do not make a murderer but they do make other people curious about what's making you tick. So, so my, my discussion about Jeremy Reagan was not cruel. This was a guy that did multiple interviews, big name interviews, as well as small, obscure YouTube channels. He wanted to be a part of this story. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Number one, I thought, okay, well, he's a law student. Perhaps he thinks this is somehow going to help him in his lawyering career. No, he said becoming a crim criminal defense attorney is third on his list of things he might like to do with his law degree. So he kind of he kind of separated himself from it in that fashion. And then he and then he in in an extraordinary interview where he's now changed his complete personality from the first interview to now this final interview where he's, you know, a robot. He he says in a shocking jaw-dropping moment and I and I had visions of Barry Morphew. He said, oh, yeah, I, I love true crime. Yeah, I watch it all the time. I think about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure do. <laughs> I thought, gosh, this guy is, is worthy of some attention. And so I was respectful. I did not engage in wild speculation. We watched his interview. And I commented on what it was that I was observing. Okay. So it's respectful. And so this conversation about John, Jack, show alter, show alter. I'm going to attempt to do the same thing. Now he is the exact opposite of Jeremy Reagan where Jeremy Reagan is not involved. He didn't see anything. He didn't know them. And yet he inserted himself into this story to where his face was everywhere. John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith. His name is Jack's name too. 
I mean, these guys, these, these guys have so many names. And when I say these guys, I mean the show alter family. There's lots of shared names. This is a, this is one of those uh, elite European heritage families. That's right. Less than 10,000 show altars in the world. And they all seem to be mixed in, mixed up with high level college athletics, medicine, and yes, even the show, baseball, the big one, um, uh, medicine, lots of specialists, doctors. In fact, John Jack Showalter's father is an orthopedic specialist surgeon. That is impressive. His mom, too. She is a medical doctor. His brother, well, he's a little stud muffin. Um, he's a big shot uh, quarterback or, or was a quarterback for um, a college. And later, I'm not going to go, I don't want to go into all the family members. And here's the reason I don't want to go into all the family members. Because they're all impressive. Because everybody's living in mansions. Even, even a show altar in Lebanon, Indiana. You know what else? The show altar elite European family of less than 10,000 in the world. You know what else they do? They love to hunt. They love to hunt. Shades of very Morphew. That's right. They're not hunting chipmunks like we had Barry Morphew doing. No, they go for the big animals. The big ones. You know, like you find in Africa. This family, Buzz is the father of Jack. Now they call him Jack. His first name is John. There's There are John show altars. There are Jack show altars. There are Larry show altars. There's Buzz show altar. There's Buddy show altar. I mean, the show altars are a big damn deal if you're into family trees and such. The majority of it, they can't, they, guess where they came from? Those of you that like conspiracy theories, those of you that like to look at the royal family and the heritage and where these people came from and who were their offspring today, those people, you know, like Freeman Fly, I used to love that guy. I'm not sure where he went. I love to listen to him. Um, if you like that kind of thing, this belief that there's a certain number of families in their direct lineage and that kind of thing, well... The Showalter family was originally coming out of Switzerland. <laughs> you can't make this up. Switzerland. And they escaped unfair taxation and a multitude of other sins. And they ended up in Germany and France and somewhere else. Germany, France, and Crimea. But now they've all moved here to the USA. There's a few left in Germany, not very many. There's a few in um, Canada, Alberta, Canada, not many. The greatest majority of the show altars are, that's right, the US of A, the, the heart of capitalism, making your money, get, making your mark, leaving your heritage, right? Why am I going into all this boring history? Why? Because when it comes to psychology, when it comes to the things that create drive and instinct in a person, our identity matters. 
the the identity of the individual is first formed in the overall identity of the family. If you grow up in a family where the largest majority of people in the family are drug addicts and alcoholics, you have a different world view than people who grow up in a family where everybody is expected to become an attorney general. Everyone is expected to engage in athletics and at least at a bare minimum be competitive at the college level. Yes, we have some show alters that are training currently for the Olympics. It's a very impressive family, people. Very impressive. Multiple doctors, not, not just Larry and, and his wife. Multiple doctors, multiple physicians throughout history. Many elected officials, both state elections as well as federal government. There's even an attorney general thrown in here or there if you look at the Crow family and some of the offshoots of the show alters. And, and so if you happen to be one of the unfortunate children born into one of these families, notice I said unfortunate. We all have our burdens to carry people. And you may not think that, you know, a 17, 16, 17 year old kid who wears Ralph Lauren as his, you know, knocking around clothes, whose first car is an Audi, who aspires to a Jaguar, whose, whose weekend trips are to Boston to have lobster at Angelo's on the Bay. You, you may think that that life that you would be happy and all would be well, but I'm going to tell you those kids in those types of families, it's not all fun and games. It's terrible burden. It's a terrible, terrible burden burden because by the just the law of averages, the way that statistics work, the majority of us are in danger of mediocrity. We're all going to pretty much be average. We're not going to be very low in, in skills and accomplishment. We're not going to be extraordinarily high in skills and accomplishment. That's why it, they call it normal because most people are in that range. So for you and I, as healthy people, we say, no, 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 I'm normal. I went to school. I made A's, B's, and a few C's. I graduated in the middle of my class. I have a great job making about a median income. I live in a house that is no bigger or smaller than all my friends. I'm living a normal life and I feel good about that. I'm not, I'm not living a life of quiet desperation where when I sleep at night, I have fear that the roof is going to cave in on my head and I am not living in a life where I crave a mansion just to prove that I matter. I'm normal. I'm middle class and I like it that way. Nuh uh. You get born into one of these families, a bush, a show altar, a Rockefeller. You get born into one of these families. We are not normal. We are the mediocre. We're the peons. We are the slave class. Do you want to be that kid? Do you want to be that kid who, if you come home with A's and B's, maybe C's, that you get to hear all about what a fail you are, failure you are, and how daddy's not giving you any money, any of the family riches? You'll be written out of the will, Jack, if you kill anyone. Correct? And if that's not bad enough, that you've got to live up to the name that's attached to your identity. If you've got to live up to the name that's attached to your identity, 
you got to try to be, you got to try to walk in the same shoes as that, those attorneys general, all those surgeons and physicians. How about that hot shot stud muffin quarterback brother? Yeah, old Jack, he had a rough life. Things have not been easy for Jack. Know what I mean? Well, here's why I'm bringing this up. Because we know now that Jack, show alter, that he is a member of Delta Tau Delta fraternity. In fact, that was pretty much his identifying information on his social media. Except now all the social media is gone. They're cleaning the internet of old Jack. Even Jack's mom and dad, their social media stuff. They're, they're, they had a, they have, um, they have an outreach, a medical outreach in Kenya, Africa. Um, they have homes in South Africa and I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, but they're busy. His family has been busy putting their money to use to hire this particular um, type of attorney who goes around and cleans up all these messy internet sites. You know, like if you, ha you have a channel on YouTube and you have some cretin that becomes obsessed with you and they begin making, you know, a, a unfair, untrue statements about you. And, you know, then you can hire one of these, uh, one of these uh, social media uh, attorneys and they'll go in and clean up all the rumor mill and, you know, get all that clean. And so Jack is enjoying that luxury right now. Mommy and daddy are cleaning things up. You don't believe me? Do a quick Google of John Jacob Jingleheimer Smith, John Jack Showalter. Go ahead and do a quick Google. It's very difficult to find a photograph of old Jack. Now, th these YouTubers, thank goodness. Thank goodness for our YouTubers. Because people like Plunder, Truth and Transparency, and others, they have now memorialized those photographs. They put them in a form that is going to be difficult for the for these attorneys and their search engines to find these photographs and clean them up. So we do have some photographs of Jack, but there probably won't be any new ones coming out. They're quickly erasing what they what what was out there right so jack has a great deal of benefits that you and i do not have by way of being a member of the elite class and i don't mean those people don't work for it they do work for it his mom and dad had to work their butts off to get through medical school his mom and dad work their asses off, off every day I guarantee you they're working 12 hour days. I've seen it. I've lived it. I know how that other half lives. Okay. They're, they are, they're working hard, but there's still a lot of things they have access to that you and I don't have access to. Those types of attorneys, those types of services are very expensive. So imagine that, you're Jack and you grow up in the shadow of your quarterback brother, your famous uncle, grandfather, great grandfather, grant, there's a famous grandmother. There's a cousin who's training for the Olympics. Um, imagine you grow up in this highly elite family where the worst possible thing that could happen to you is that you could be average. You think that might create a situation for a little bit of anger, a little bit of anger, maybe. 
because what we now know about Delta Ta Delta is that Jack had a lot of trouble. Now, I don't know what's causing Jack's problems. I don't know if Jack has an alcohol problem. I don't know if Jack just felt entitled and he felt like people were not deferring to the greatness of the show alter name. I'm not sure what was creating these troubles for Jack, but I can promise you this for a Greek, for, for a fraternity, we're not even talking about sorority. Okay. For a fraternity to decide you are a liability. Guess what? Jack, you're out of control. Now, you know you're out of control. I know that you're out of control just because of the things I know about the Greek life and fraternities and what you guys typically engage in. And if they got rid of you, you're in trouble, Jack. The very fact that they kicked you out tells me everything I need to know about your ability to manage your emotions and that when your emotions get triggered, that Jack acts out. Now you may say, hold on, Jules, why are you talking to Jack? Is he here? Well, I don't know, guys. What do you think? What would be your guess? Mom and dad are busy hiring reputation handlers. They're cleaning up the internet. They're, they're erasing all the family photos and connections possible. What do you think? Do you think Jack is here? If you believe that Jack is watching all of these YouTube video, videos, reading all the Reddit threads, put a one. If you think Jack hasn't got a care in the world and that he's just going for his morning swim, no problems, no harm, no foul, put a two. Just curious. Oh, yeah. Jack's watching. He's watching. Um, not just Jack, but their attorneys are watching as well. Everybody's watching. Okay. Um, why are they watching? Because, because it's the family is the business. You, you got a very um, successful mom and dad. You've got this really, really notorious murder scene. And guess who appears to be the last interaction with Maddie and Kaylee. It was Jack. That was the last apparent interaction within about an hour of them being slaughtered. Kind of like when you kill a deer and you want to, you know, field dress it. You got to cut their throat, let them bleed out. So you keep the meat clean. Incidentally, old Jack, some photos of, you know, his first kill, field dressing animals in Africa, K-bar knives laying on the ground. Why do I say that he was possibly, probably the last known interaction? with uh, for sure Maddie and possibly Kaylee. Because we know that minutes before Maddie and Kaylee grabbed their food and ran away from Jack, we know that Maddie turned around and looked at Jack and pointed at him, arm outstretched, and says loud enough, that you can hear it above the sound of people talking, ordering their food, drunk people laughing, having fun. You can absolutely clearly hear 
Maddie say to Jack, fuck you. There's all this other conversation going on. There's all these kids laughing, having fun, enjoying themselves after a night out. You can hear the people cooking inside the, the grub hub. So how loud do you think she had to have said that for it to be so easily discernible on the tape, on the, on the Twitch stream? She says it clearer than day, pointing right at him. F you. Why? 